Hello, Internet. You know, there's a lot of things you know about me, but uh, we traveled a, a lot. Uh, my father was a, a regional magistrate, and so we, we really went to many, many places. So we were all from, you know, from the Cape province to Transvaal to, to Namibia, St. Vese. And I never really learned how to speak English. So I speak it with a, with a fantastic accent, which my wife finds find quite attractive. But I can tell you I'm at a loss when I'm in a place like Europe because none of the Europeans even know what I'm speaking if I'm doing my best English accent. So I've learned how to speak proper English in a certain way. I say, old chap, uh, I'm very excited today to introduce to you yeah, I can do that, but you know, it doesn't suit me. I actually have to laugh at myself. And then I started with a legacy thing. I said, uh, I started by saying, Internet, hello, hello, Internet. I'm excited. We're going to see this guy today. And it became like an in house joke because I say to all the new presenters, guys, please don't copy me because I don't know what I'm doing really. I'm, I'm like, man, I, I just speak to people. And, uh, I've also realized that if I say to somebody, I forget to say that I'm excited to see this fellow, then uh, they, they look at me like this, you know, and they're like, they're not excited to see us, Chris? Yeah, so I think that will be my my trademark here. And you'll find out just now why I'm, why I'm saying all these things. So Welcome to Legacy Conversations a channel where we preserve military memories and history. Before I say tot sins manure, I'd just like to make a final statement. And please don't take me the wrong way. You, you are doing an excellent job with your interviews and editing, but I do miss all the courses introduction with a strong accent of how excited you be. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Wom I, I, I couldn't resist that. <laughs> Sorry, Wom Dog. I can't pick it for here. Mensa, on set for Wom Dog, he's so fun, Rhodesia. I'm trying very hard. I don't think I can ever, ever match Quiz. <laughs> but I'm sure Quiz <laughs> is going to appreciate that. I might just have to show him a snip of this and get him to do an intro for us. I think I will do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's up to you. <laughs> Thank you very, very, very much. Doug. I want to welcome from Doc Sinclair, also known as Moose from the Rhodesian Air Force here. He's been speaking to Fossey for hours and hours, and we're very grateful for his time, as well as that of his wife, who ably assisted him. Uh, I noticed some of his comments and the other Air Force guys, and somebody in Canada, actually, also a flight test engineer, said to me, Chris, you think, I think we should approach this fellow, you know, I saw his videos on uh, Fighting Men of Rhodesia, which is a fantastic channel. I really like Fighting Men. And uh, so we did. And I will never forget, in 1976, my father was transferred to Katima Malilo. And so we took the the road up of his old valiant, which in those days were not that old. And uh, we drove right through Rhodesia. And as we got over the border, I think probably at Messina or someplace, the Rhodesian army were waiting. And I don't know what regiment they were. I don't know. They were probably reservists, probably even policemen. I don't know. And uh, man, many looking women, those guys. <laughs> they looked like they could. Like they could shoot and moor at the same time, you know, they had these vicious moustaches. They were like, you could see this was a fighting army. Uh, they were hot, they were tough, and they escorted us all the way north. And it was in Bulawayo, I think, where I first time in my life actually saw TV in a hotel room. And I remember my dad in his wisdom said to me, you know, to, to the kids to us, he said, listen, this is the future. To see this now, you can watch a movie right inside your room. It's one day it's going to go to South Africa as well. Of course, it was coming to South Africa around about that time. Uh, but it would take a few years before we were back in the States. And then we discovered TV. There was still the South African flag and things on it. And that's my memory of Rhodesia. And we went through. And then 
go on a few years later now in the police I'm doing my counterinsurgency training and we know once we've done that training you're going to go to the borders you're going to fight man you're going to do something and we we were not against that idea and our instructors were Rhodesians many of them and they were such fantastic people we were trying to speak of Rikons worse than I speak English but we managed to understand each other and they were patient you know I would ask them all sorts of of questions I would keep on asking questions I wanted to know I wanted to learn everything they knew and basically they I don't know at first I must have thought I'm, I'm trying to take the mickey out of them but I wasn't I really wanted to learn and then they started teaching me because the problem we had in the SAP we were not operating in the way which we were trained we were in very very small groups uh and we were doing more counter-terrorism work than, than counter-insurgency, so we combined both, which, which took me to good fit. It took me to good, uh, what do you say that word in English? Later in life, it, uh, I learned a lot. And I remember one thing with Rhodesians that actually two things. One of them, he was a warrant officer, and he, every time we practiced his counter-ambush counter, counter -ambush drills, he would just shake his head, take his, his head off, and he stands like that, like he's praying. And he would say in his, in his Afrikaans, he would say, the minister of police is, is jammer om mee te deel. Ha is 16. SAP leren, wat geskiet gister, want hulle is even on nozzel. And he started on. And then we did it again and again until it became second nature. Yeah, that was the one thing. And then there was another one. And he sat there and he always said to us, guys, let me see your kit. And then we would show him our kit and he would say, off it. And we would off it. And then he said, you only need two things. You need ammo and you need water and you need, that's it. You need nothing else. You can, you can, that's how you can move quickly. You can't load yourself like the way you guys are loading yourself. Yeah, and then the last memory of the Rhodesians. Man, you know, the SAP went there as a counterinsurgency force, and that's where we got our camo uniform from. And uh, our camo flotch was not designed for anything but Rhodesia, in the sense that anywhere where it got cold, you were freezing. We, we had basically no warm clothes with a camo. Uh, not to the blue uniform either, but the camo was especially bad. And uh, so you learn quite quickly. You say to the sergeant instructor only once that you're cold and you're freezing because that's what you are. And then you run around to push-ups, do all sorts of things. And then you have to keep on running because the sweat will, uh, you know, freeze upon you, on your body. And then you're in trouble because now you're really cold. And then you're struggling to run as well. Long story. That happens only once or twice. And by that time, we've learned our lesson. Sergeant would come along. How's he going, man? Is he right? Is he right? Yeah, that's all. Good problem. That's my memory of the Rhodesians. Fantastic people. I owe him so much. And now I'm handing uh, Moose over here to, to, uh, to Fossey. And... Uh, I wish all of you guys just the best of luck. God bless. Hello, Internet. Greetings. Hi, hello. Dag, se. Lekker om jylle hier by ons te hee weer vandag. Yep, today um, is episode 3 of our conversation with uh, WO2 Doug Sinclair, Rhodesian Air Force. Uh, Doug, thank you so much for the previous two episodes i really really enjoyed the chats i also enjoy doing the edits i do have to just say um that episode two there was a bit of internet buffering so at times my my uh, my editing took a difficult turn but just for those of you that haven't watched yet so that you know when you go back and watch episode two uh, I loved some of those photos. The aloes really, really got hammered, as you've said before. And you're going to tell us more tales. I know specifically from um, watching your Ops Dingo episode on Fighting Men of Rhodesia, your aloe took 
a beating and a variety for a variety of reasons but i'm going to leave you to tell us about it so welcome again doug thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us thank you so much also for uh, as i've said before for slanting your uh, chats specifically aimed at the uh, a south african slash saf audience and for enlightening us, I, I do now know what a K car is. I also know, now know what a G car is and a fire force. So thank you so much. I'm going to pipe up and I'm going to say again, welcome, Doug. Um, all yours. Fossi explained that I'll be talking about some operations. Uh, I'm going to talk about a Pacific operation. This Pacific operation was divided into two parts. It was called Operation Dinga, and that was in 1977. Operation Dinga was our biggest all Rhodesian operation that had been had taken place so far. And um, there was a terrorist camp in a place called Chomoyo, approximately 90 kilometers from Lake Alexandra, which was our springboard just inside our own border. And these blokes, their camp was on an ex-Portuguese tobacco farm. So they, they had all the buildings, etc., to use as their headquarters, etc. With this, as I said, our largest op. Rhodesian Air Force used 52 aircraft on this operation. I'll just give you a quick breakdown. They had seven hunters, four vampire FB-5s, four Canberra bombers, 10 K cars, 22 G cars, one DC-7, that belonged to Jack Mullock. It didn't belong to the Air Force. And one DC-8, also belonging to Jack Mullock. One Lynx, which was a Cessna Skymaster. And seven DC-3s for the para-drops. That was basically what the operation was going to be. Now, I just want to go back to... Just recently, I got news of a, a South African soldier, uh, airman, that had passed away near to us here in Brisbane. And his name was David Nicholson. Very few people knew his name was, Christian name was David, because everyone knew him as Chopper Nicholson. That was his name, just Chopper. We referred to him as Chopper Nicholson. He was an ex Cessna pilot, so he operated with the SAP uh, Cessna 185s. And uh, that was in support of the South African police camps in the early days. And then later on, I don't know where the secondment to our Air Force took place, but he was then seconded to our Air Force as an Alouette pilot. And he was very known in our circles with the, all the Alouette crews. So I would like to dedicate this following talk to Chopper Nicholson. Thank you. I want to go to three days before this operation. We were based in a place called Gwanda, south of Bulawayo, and that was near to the border with Botswana. Uh, we only had two G cars in support of RAR, Rhodesian African Rifles. It should have been a fire force, but I think the fire forces were so spread out and they couldn't afford to give Lionel Dyke, who was the the, the commander of the uh, RAR, they couldn't give him a K car or a, a fire force as such. <clears throat> anyway, the day after we arrived there, his men got into a contact and straight away Lionel 
made a deal with our pilots that he would go in one G car and that G car would go into a K car roll. Not ideal because he only had twin 303 Brownings and not a cannon. And our helicopter, we went in as a G car, just <clears throat> taking in four extra troops. The other helicopter, he did get into, uh, they had a sighting and they started firing at these <clears throat> chaps in the riverbed. And the tech kept on getting uh, hang-ups with his weapons and kept on stopping, stoppages. Anyway, they did their best and they decided because of the stoppages in the weapon, they decided to, the initial contact was now over, <clears throat> trying to get our troops within the stop line, only four blokes and the others to follow up. And that helicopter departed to go back to base to see if he could sort out his weapons. What happened as soon as he was departing, he was shot at and the tech took a small arms round, an AK round, in his leg. It entered just above the ankle. It traveled up his leg and exited it on the top of his knee. Not a nice wound. <clears throat> so you can imagine he was in much pain and what was going on in that cockpit. <clears throat> By the time the helicopter had landed, there was blood splattered all inside the cockpit of the aircraft and they were trying to do what they could for the tech. His name was Adrian Rosenberg. Anyway, we left our troops uh, because the, the contact was over. We left them on the ground to come back to collect more troops at the Gwanda base. And when we got there, we, they were struggling to get Ray, uh, Adrian out of the, the helicopter because he couldn't bend his leg and he was squealing with pain. Poor bloke. And we got there to help get Adrian out and onto a stretcher. Once he was on a stretcher, <clears throat> we had to get away from there because we were told that a crawl aircraft that was police reserve air wing but i think it was a cessna 182 was going to kazavak adrian to bulawayo hospital so we were happy with that and we went back to the scene with more troops what we didn't know that adrian they couldn't load the stretcher into the the aircraft it was too small <clears throat> so they wanted to and adrian was over six foot tall and they wanted Adrian to bend his leg so they could try and get him into the the back of the aircraft without the stretcher. Well, <clears throat> that just wasn't going to work because he had already been uh, pumped with sausagon to try and ease the pain. And uh, I believe that hadn't reacted yet. And what we didn't know is that Poor Adrian, they had now made a decision that they'd put him in the back of a Land Rover and take him to Bulawayo Hospital. And I think it's nearly a two hour drive. And he cursed us afterwards. He said, you know, I've caseverked many, many blokes before in our helicopters. And the day I get wounded, there's no helicopter to caseverk me <laughs> to Bulawayo. And, Later, we learned about that and didn't feel so good about it. Anyway, that's what happened at that. And the next day, I don't know the reason, but we were tasked to go to Tule Circle. And I think a lot of people know where that is. It's on the southeastern border of Rhodesia, adjacent to, on, on the border with Botswana. And my pilot, which I had strapped into mirages before, was Steve Murray. And we went trundling off to Tudy Circle, landed there. He took 
whatever documents it was, I think they were secret documents to the police station, <clears throat> dropped them off. When we tried to restart the helicopter, I've forgotten what the exact problem was, but engine change. So he had to go back to the police station and try and work through the network. They used different frequencies to the army and eventually got the message through. And that message finally got through to Salisbury and they dispatched an Islander aircraft, which is a two-engined British aircraft. And with the spare Alouette engine and a tech, <clears throat> an engine tech, to come and help me do the engine change at Tule Circle. Anyway, the Islander landed, they transferred the engine to the back of a Land Rover, brought it up to the police station with the, the little hoist that we, hand-operated hoist that we used for changing engines. And, and I had already removed the, uh, the trailer shroud and the jet pipe and the elephant years by the time the islander arrived we got stuck straight into the engine change and steve came down from the police station and said boys this is an emergency we've got to get back to Gwanda as soon as possible and he said no you're kidding and he said no this is serious so we completed semi-completed the job as quickly as possible we loaded the Strela Shroud and the two elephant ears which hold the sand filters. We loaded them into the back where the back seat of the chopper was. We folded the seat up, loaded them in there, tied them in, and took off for Gwanda. Now, under certain normal circumstances, as your flight engineers know, we have to do an engineer test. Well, our engineer test was done on the way back to Gwanda <laughs> with, with elephant ears off and et cetera. When we landed at Gwanda, uh, the boss man there, he came running out to meet us and he said, look, just grab your stuff out of your tents, load them up, refuel and get back to Salisbury now. And he said, but it's a bit late in the day. He says, no, it's an emergency. You've got to get back to Salisbury now. So we still haven't done fitted our elephant ears and our Australia shard and packed our kit into the chopper and off we went. We had to refuel on the way and when we got to New Serum, it was now night time. And the whole place, the whole New Serum camp was lit up, brightly lit and there was a high activity. And, oh, straight away we knew something was on. Anyway, they cleared the, the, the helicopter landing pad for us, and that's where we landed. And straight away, the chaps from uh, SA, <clears throat> ASS, Aircraft Servicing Squadron, came and intercepted our aeroplane to go and complete assembling it in, <clears throat> in their hangar. That is when we found out that everyone was working hammer and tong on helicopters, trying to sort their helicopters out and then we had to go to supper uh, after supper we slept in the hangars on stretches no phone calls were allowed to be made going out the station in fact i think the the telephone exchange off station was disconnected the reason for this is there had been security leaks but nobody knew where the security leaks had come from whether it was from the airmen, the officers, or their wives, or nobody knew. Later on, we did discover where the leaks were, and they were coming from combined operations, from COMOPs. Anyway, it was all top secret. And the next morning, we woke up in the hangars and continued preparing airplanes. So we were told to get Every helicopter, all 32 helicopters serviceable. Every one had to be used. Um, our pilots, they went down to the uh, rugby ground, the sports field, and there a tent, a mark, big marquee had been set up. And they were shown a sand model of the, uh, 
the, the target site and what it was all about and how the whole uh, operation be conducted. Now, you can imagine that marquee was full of blue jobs because there were the Kendall pilots and the Hunter pilots and the vampire pilots and you, all of us, chopper pilots. And us techs worked on the aircraft. At the end of the day, we were told that first, first light in the morning, we would take off and head to Grand Reef. In the early hours of the morning, as it was starting to get light, the choppers went off in sections, and I'll tell you the reason why. Each section, there were four helicopters to each call sign. So uh, when the, uh, the control tower was given clearance, etc., if any civilian aircraft were listening to the frequencies, it just sounded as if there was eight helicopters heading off to uh, Grand Reef. But really, there were 32 helicopters. Our routes, we all had different routes. One group of four helicopters would fly over Marindera, for argument's sake. The other, another two groups would fly to the south, and the others would fly to the north. So if anyone observed the helicopters from the ground, they'd only see four helicopters heading to the east. And you know, there would be no suspicion that there's a big op taking place. When we arrived at Grand Reef, there were drums of fuel all put off down the, the main runway. And that's where the choppers landed. Uh, the runway was no longer in use for fixed wings. And 32 helicopters landed along the main runway next to their couple of drums of fuel. Um, the pilots went in for a, a briefing. And at this stage, the techs, we still didn't know exactly what was going on. We a little bit of the mushroom club. But I think it was just felt we didn't have to know what was going on. It was more important for the pilots. Uh, so we spent the day not doing much, doing the final adjustments to our aircraft and making sure amber belts were all sorted out, etc. At this stage, I just want to explain that I did say there were 10 K cars, so there was the K car section, there were 11 G cars to carry troops, that was the RLI. And the 12th G car of that lot, he followed the K cars and flew into an orbit a lot higher than the K cars. And he had the main Air Force controller, which is Wing Commander Walsh, and the main Army controller, the Army commander, and that was, I think he was a major at that stage, Major Robinson. And that G car was specially fitted with double radios. So the, the army commander had his own frequencies he could work on, different to the Air Force bloke with his frequencies. That was an unusual radio fit for an Alouette. The remaining Alouettes were, they, they were, sorry, the ones, the troopers, they were referred to as yellow section. The remaining Alouettes were now pink section, and pink section, their duty was to uplift people, uh, to guard the administration area, the people who uh, controlled the administration area with the radios and the radio techs, and uh, Lots of spare ammunition and spares, etc. And that's how pink section would operate. Anyway, we all flew off on the morning, off to uh, Lake Alexandra. And that's where our springboard was for the operation. While we were all parked there at Lake Alexandra, fuel drums had been put out ready for us, etc. I would have loved to have had a photograph of those 32 helicopters. 
Um, we had to loiter for a while because apparently uh, the aircraft that was flying very high over the target area said there was too much mist, too much low cloud, and we had to hang off for a little bit. So the way the operation commenced was Jack Mullock with his DC-8. He had to fly over the target. I'm not sure how long before the operation took started, but he flew pretty high with his DC-8, flaps down, throttles open, making lots of noise and flying over the target area. And this was to get everyone on the ground excited and running to their uh, trenches and anti-aircraft posts and everything and get them excited, which I believe did happen. And then, of course, they discovered, no, it's just a civilian aircraft flying over. So everyone relaxed and went back to their duties. And I think they went back to their morning muster parade, which was ideal for our Canberra targets. Now, when we were flying in, we, we, we got a clearance. Yes, everything's all go now. So we got airborne and we flew fairly high exiting our border. And later on, we had to duck down very low to mask our sound so we didn't forewarn the enemy that the choppers were coming. But while we were flying high and went over the, our border area into Mozambique, we were, got revved. Somebody was having a good target at us. But we were told we weren't allowed to react. No reaction, just carry on flying. And that's what happened. Uh, then we ducked down to very low level. It was a predetermined flight path. You, you are flying up ravines. So the 10K cars and the 12G cars were all very low level, flying one behind the other into the target area. The timing was spot on. Uh, I don't know which number K car I was in, but I wasn't in the front. And when the K cars started to got to the target near the target area, they started to lift up. Uh, noise was now long, no longer an issue, and we could get up into the flight orbit height of eight hundred feet. Well, as we did this. The hunters were already in their high dives, taking out what predetermined anti-aircraft positions. So they were having fun with their high dives. And of course, they came in their high dive. It was a silent aircraft. The canvas came in from, a, I don't know what altitude was, but they were coming and gliding in now with engines throttled back, not to make a noise, to warn the enemy, and they now came right down to 300 feet. So we were flying at 800 feet, looking down on the canvas when they flew over the target area and dropped the alpha bombs. Alpha bombs were the Rhodesian made bombs, designed and made, but they were bouncing bombs. So the, they were spheres. And when they hit the ground, they would bounce like a rubber ball and bounce up, but as soon as it hit the ground, it triggered the firing mechanism. So as the ball was now bouncing upwards, it would explode and send shrapnel in every direction. And of course, each Canberra, I think they carried, I think it was 400 alpha bombs each. And those four Canberras dropped those alpha bombs on that muster parade that was going on down in the drill square, and it, it was a lovely view just to see what was going on. And of course, the hunters had now finished their high dive, the canvas swooped in a couple of seconds after they dropped the alphas, and we now got into our orbit areas. With the 10K cars, we had five target areas, so there was a pair of K cars to each target. Uh, Unfortunately for our pair of K cars, we went into an area where 
the anti-aircraft guns had not been silenced by the hunters. I don't know the reason. Maybe the photographs haven't picked them up or they had moved the gun sites since the reconnaissance photographs had been taken. So we got into our orbit area and we were having fun with this 14.5 millimeter anti-aircraft gun having a good go at us. Um, we actually felt quite safe because we could hear the, the big rounds, the 14.5 mil rounds going boom, 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 boom in front of us. And as long as they were coming up in front of us, we were fairly happy. The reason for this is because the enemy on the ground using the anti-aircraft guns, they hadn't allowed for slow moving choppers. They had been taught how to fire, how to aim at any aircraft flying at maybe 250 knots plus. So that's why their aim was not good with us helicopters only flying at 63 knots. But what we did encounter was a hang of a lot of small arms fire. We could feel that we had taken quite a few hits. I'd already opened fire on targets in our area and the game was on. And as I said, we could feel the hits on the aircraft. We've taken quite a few already, but continued in our orbit and I had a stoppage on my cannon. I couldn't sort it out. What it was, was a broken firing pin and I didn't have a spare firing pin in the cockpit with me. So we were no longer uh, able and had to clear out the area. But before we cleared out the area, I just want to tell you uh, in part of our orbit, there was a tractor on a little dam wall, it was a little stock dam. And each time I flew over the tractor, I gave it a burst of 20 mil. And now we had the stoppage, we had to fly off to the admin area. So we were no good. That was my day of uh, military activity in the target area. When we were nearing the administration area, that was approximately 10 minutes flying from our target. It was an area designated that seemed to be suitable for all the helicopters to land in a like a flat, open flight area. We couldn't go straight in and land because the DC-7, which was Jack Malik's aircraft, he was still busy dropping drums of fuel by parachute into the our LZ area. So we had to hold off. And of course, Pink Section, who would bring in all their operators and guards, everything to that admin area, they had to hold off as well. Until the DC-7 had finished dropping his fuel. Once he had cleared the area, we moved in, landed where the fuel drums were, and I was hoping I could find somebody or some parcel that had come in an a parachute to see if I could find the armament spares, but to no avail. It was still very unorganized in the admin area. And I went back to the pilot and I gave him the finger across the throat to indicate to him to shut down. And that's exactly what he did. So this allo, she had been flying happily all this time. But when the engine shut down and it was losing revs, you could just hear the noise. And <laughs> poor imitation, but that's what happened. And straight away, we knew we'd been hit in the engine. Quick look revealed that we'd taken a round in the compressor casing. We'd taken several other rounds. Uh, the other one, which could have been a problem, but wasn't, was we were hit in the fuel tank, but it was above halfway mark. So it was in the area where there was no self-sealing and it didn't worry us too much. We could still have half, uh, maintain half a tank of fuel. Anyway, now with this incident, the engine shutting down, the pilot had to quickly try and locate where the, the new communications were still trying to set themselves up and 
radio for help because the pink section helicopters now that had dropped these blokes off, they would go back to Lake Alexandra and wait for further instructions. But of course, straight away, one or two of them were sent off to go and get spares. So I started getting ready for the engine change, removing the Strela shroud and the elephant ears in preparation for when the new engine came, I was as prepared as possible for when the engine change. <clears throat> well, while I was doing this, a helicopter came in and he had, had taken a hit in the main rotor blade. And that was by a 14.5 round had gone through a main rotor blade. So it was quite a big hole. That was the helicopter that was in command with the double radios and, and the, the army commander controlling the whole scene. So he was now out of action. Then a little bit of a hesitation on the ground with all our troops in the contact area. And that's where the backup commander in the Lynx aircraft, who was flying even higher, he was now had uh, a backup army commander there to take over control. And he was having anti-aircraft fire shot at him as well, coming fairly close to him. But anyway, when this commander K, well, it wasn't a K car, the commander G car came in, straight away it was a case that we'd have to rob our my main rotor blades to replace his. So uh, now that commenced. And a signal will go off for another request to bring in spare main rotor blades. Not too long after that, another Alouette came in. He had taken a small arms fire through his tail rotor blades. And that was causing a vibration in the aircraft and they came in. So my tail rotor blades were now robbed to fix up his aircraft so they could get back to the action. Well, by midday, my poor helicopter looked like a skeleton. It had no engine, no main rotor blades, no tail rotor blades, and my cannon was in pieces because if anyone else coming in with a K car to refuel and he thought he needed spares, he came and robbed my cannon. So it was, I wish I had a photograph of that lot. It was a sore looking sight. Anyway, new engine with some text to help as well. A new engine, new main rotor blades slung under a G car, and new tail rotor blades came in. And we were told we had to have my aircraft serviceable and out of there before sunset because nobody, no aircraft could be left in Mozambique overnight. And that's exactly how it happened. So now, three days after my previous engine change, we now took off again near, near sunset, but took off without elephant ears fitted, no Australia shroud fitted, those strapped in the back of the helicopter because we didn't have time to complete that. And once again, getting airborne to go back to base, doing our engine, uh, engine air test on the way. <laughs> and that's how it went. So, I didn't see too much action again after that. Once we got back to base, you know, your your normal crew room talk happens. Obviously, the pilots, they've been their talks and what happened there and our ground crew talking about their experiences. And what I learned was with the, all the other, well, most of the other KCAR operators, gunners, as the operation moved and took place. So the K cars moved as well, now taking on new targets. So every gunner that flew over that tractor and that damn wall had to go with it with his 20 mil. I only wish I could have been able to go back afterwards and have a good look at that tractor to see that the damage was. I don't know how many K cars had a, a good go at that poor tractor. Just a a little bit of interest. Um, 
with that operation, I just want to, what I was talking about specs. I just want to recap something I didn't mention. There were 96 SAS that were deployed in the, the parachute decks, the paradex, and 40 RLI troops that were deployed with the, the, uh, the troopers, the Alouette troopers. And I just want to mention something. They also discovered in that camp, they had baboons tied up in the camp. And the reason for this is the baboon had a, a far more a sensitive hearing than a human. And they could hear aircraft approaching long before humans could. So this was the gook's early warning system in the camps, that these baboons would hear the aircraft and start getting excited because they'd you know, been uh, in contact areas before and knew all about gunfire. That was basically the end of Zulu 1. As I said, this was broken up into two parts. And when we got back to New Serum, we were told, ah, now there's another target. It's called the Zulu 2. And off our pilots went to that same marquee down in the sports fields, and there was a new sand mock-up of the new target area, and they were briefed once again. And all of us techs frantically working on airplanes and trying to sort them out because most of the K cars had, had bullet holes in them and whatever. And a lot of servicing going on and anticipating your servicing and jacking up uh, putt putts that weren't working properly. Those are refueling uh, units. That sort of thing. And you can imagine all the fixed wing squadrons work, worked equally as hard doing turnarounds on all those fixed wing aircraft and getting them rearmed, maybe with different armament now, etc. In preparation for Zulu 2. Now, Zulu 2, the target was called a place called Tembu. Now, Tembu was from Mount Darwin which is our, one of our main uh, fire force bases up in the Northeast. It was 220 kilometers from Darwin to the target area. Because of that, our G cars had to load up a lot of fuel and did not carry troops to the target area. All the troops that went to that target were Paris that went in by the, the Dakotas and did parachute drop-ins. Of course, as K cars, we didn't have army commanders, so we could load up with extra fuel to do our journey. Um, our last stop inside our border was a place called Chosuiti, just inside Rhodesia. That's where we did our final Rhodesian refueling. Our next stop was it is a mountain, a long flat top mountain called the train, because from the distance it looked like a train. And it was pretty much <clears throat> uh, well, very difficult for anyone to climb up, up onto the top of that mountain with the flat top. So that's where the DC-7 had dropped drums of fuel for us. So that's where we had our last refueling stop. It was very close to where Kabora Bassa is now. And everyone topped up as much fuel as they could in the helicopters. We then started on our last part of our journey on that long leg into the admin area, which was close to the target area. Once again, this admin area was a photographed area of what looked like a fly and a decent LZ for the helicopters. And that's where the DC would drop the fuel drums or fuel just before we arrived there, the DC-7, which happened. And of course, we all landed and quickly trying to find fuel drums to refuel our helicopters ready for the attack. This is an awkward site because maybe what the photographs hadn't shown is this flay area 
wetland area, if you want to call it, but is now dry, had huge tufts of grass, some of them nearly the size of half a drum. So some of us had to cut our drums of fuel, cut the, the parachute ropes and cut them out of trees and let them fall on the ground. And some of them were actually on the ground and missed the trees. And we had to try and, and roll these drums to our choppers. But when you got to the flay area, we couldn't roll our drums. We had to now turn those drums end on end to get them to our chopper. And I'll tell you what, that was backbreaking work. And it didn't matter if it was a small technician or a big burly technician, <laughs> we all had to look after our own. And that was pretty hard work. And I got the choppers ready and the strike hour, D hour took place. And with our K cars, not the G cars, our K cars, we entered the area four minutes after the cameras had dropped their bombs and the hunters had done their strikes on the anti-aircraft positions. So very similar to the Chamoya scene, but less people on the ground. We later learned there could have been a security leak, which we think happened, and a hell of a lot of those troops had left the camp to go to another small town north, closer to Tanzania, and the hierarchy as well. So it was a little bit of a disappointment for our strike force and for our blokes on the ground. Yes, they had some resistance. There were some troops left behind and they had to clear trenches, etc. But in the, the area designated to the G car I was in, there was very really little action. I used very really little ammo. We used a little bit of ammo and the odd target we could see, but it was sparse. As I said, a little bit disappointing. What actually happened during that contact uh, a couple of captives were taken, which was always a plus, and straight away they were interrogated and they spilt the beans that whether it was half the force or a large contingent of their force had moved out the day before and were in this town just up north. So that information was relayed to our aircraft, our fixed wing aircraft, and they went and had a go at that town. Nobody knows what the result of that was because no ground troops went into there at all. But uh, I think they, they did some damage and caught some people off guard. When uh, our troops had done their sweep through and whatever, it was now time for us to depart. Get, get back to Rhodesia before sunset. Um, remembering now that half of our troops would stay behind and the other half of our troops would be picked up with the element, with the G-cars. Unfortunately, those G-cars had to load up the parachutes as well and take troops and parachutes back to Rhodesia across the Kabora Bassa and home. Uh, I just want to mention at this stage, what happened with one of the G cars. He was, when, when the G car is loaded with parachutes, they load those parachutes between the front seats, which are in the reverse position, <clears throat> and between the seats and the perspex. So that's where they were safe from being blown around in the wind. And when the ground troops brought the parachutes, they just rolled them up as best they could and just loading the helicopter. Nobody was keeping count on how many parachutes and if the tech and pilot weren't on their toes, your aircraft is overloaded now. And that's what happened to this one particular G car. He was overloaded and with all this weight of the parachutes up front, too many parachutes, his center of gravity was very far forward. To those who don't know about the helicopter, I'll try and explain. 
He didn't have an attitude like that when flying forward. But this poor helicopter, because he had so much weight in the front, gravity was too far forward and he was leaning at a more aggravated angle, trying to keep forward flight. What this resulted in is over Kabula Vasa, the pilots got a fuel warning light. And when a crew gets a fuel warning light, you don't bother trying to argue with that. You know that once the, the light starts flicking, once the light comes to full on, the pilot would push a stopwatch and you would have 10 minutes of safe flying and you had to land within 10 minutes, not beyond 10 minutes because you'd like you to run out of fuel. And this pilot, he calculated that he wouldn't make it across Kabora Basin. So he had to put down on an island in somewhere in Kabora Basin, hoping that it was a deserted island, which it was. Uh, a, a tricky LZ. Um, somebody said that he landed on an island of weeds. No, <laughs> an island of weeds wouldn't support the weight of the helicopter, but I think he had to land with his wheels in the water so his wheels are submerged, but he was on hard, firm ground because there were too many boulders around on the main island itself. And they had to wait for help. Fortunately, old Jack Mullock's DC-7, I don't know if he still had drums on board or if they had to quickly load up drums, but he came to the rescue and Parrot dropped a drum of fuel, or maybe a couple of drums in case they lost one in the on the drop for these blokes on this island so the tech could refuel the aircraft and they could continue their journey. Just a little bit of interest there. What my take is on here, really the pilots did have enough fuel to make it across the lake like the rest of the G-cars, but because his attitude was so uh, pronounced, all his fuel in his fuel tank now surged to the front of the fuel tank. And of course, the fuel tank transmitter is at the rear of the fuel tank, unfortunately. So his fuel tank transmitter, the uh, float, now touched the contacts to tell him, hey, they switched on the uh, red warning light to say we are out of fuel. And that's what the pilot doesn't argue about. But Really, he had enough to go across, but that's how it worked out. That was his reason. He wasn't short on fuel physically. Anyway, while all this was taking place and we were all returning to Rhodesia, some mean thunderstorms now brewed up. And it was widespread right throughout. It, it was like an a intertropical convergence zone that came across. And we met up with us. Lots of thunder and lightning. And uh, we were lucky we didn't fly into hail. But the drops were so big that when our rotor blades were hitting these huge drops of rain, they were blistering the tape on the leading edge of the blades, that tape to protect the, the leading edge. And that blistered tape was now starting to whistle and tell us an <laughs> unhappy tape. Of course, the formation, it was strung out anyway, but the formation just bombshelled and every pilot took a route that he thought was the safest, trying to dodge around these storms. And that's what happened. Some of the aircraft, K cars and G cars, made it to some decent destinations. A couple of them had to land on a farm somewhere. We were unfortunate with our flight path, and we had to do so much dodging of thunderstorms that it was starting to get too dark for comfort. And uh, I don't know how these pilots navigated in conditions like that, but eventually we saw some lights, and knowing in Mozambique, the there's no place with lights like that, and we head for that. 
And that was a place called Mukumbura, just inside our border. Mukumbura was actually a town on the border between Mozambique and Rhodesia. And we managed to find the airfield and land there safely. We looked, went into the campsite to look to see if we could scrounge some food, some grub, but uh, the mess tents were empty. The wall, it was still raining pretty heavily as well, but all the brown jobs that had the greys and were billeted up in their tents for the night. And there's these blue jobs walking around, fending for ourselves. My pilot, he went his way and I think he, he found a, a stretcher for the night somewhere. Uh, could have been in the ops tent. And I couldn't find anything. I went back to my aircraft. I had already used my rat pack out when we were in the, our admin base. So I didn't even have a rat pack to fall back on there. What I discovered is sleeping in a K car, how much rain leaked through the roof of that cabin. <laughs> it wasn't a comfortable night for me. With no door, yeah, on the, the cannon side, etc. Anyway, in the morning, uh, after I'd got light, I was doing my pre flight and ripped the blade tapes off. I wasn't going to try and replace them just to, to get back to base. And the pilot came along and <clears throat> we did our pre flight and now head home. And that was now. Zulu 2, over and done for us. What I just want to recap on this whole exercise, we learned afterwards that 6,000 of the enemy had been accounted for on both Zulu 1 and Zulu 2. 6,000 of the enemy. And we only lost two people. One was a, a, an army chap, and the other was a pilot. That pilot, he was flying the FB-5, and their target was a, a so-called rest and recuperation camp where they didn't have hunters support or KCAR support, and they got a warm reception when they hit that camp. And that particular vampire, he took some hits. Uh, I think they affected the engine. I'm not sure what part. He managed to make it safely back into Rhodesia, but made a forced landing. And it, it appeared to be a, a good forced landing. He was you know, pretty good about it. But he hit a ditch. And... You know, in the FB-5, the pilots are sitting right at the front of the aircraft. That nose wheel collapsed. He went straight nose in, and that was the end. And Phil Haig lost his life there. So we lost two people for the ratio of 6,000. I think it was a pretty good ratio. What we also learned afterwards, which we weren't aware of at the time, that the powers to be who are involved with the planning, etc., of all this lot, at the utmost, you know, the uh, the worst thing, they were prepared to have lost twenty percent of our troops. Had we known that, I think we would have been far more nervous about this operation. And also, at our largest hospital in the country, that is in the capital of Salisbury, they had reserved the two top floors, vacated them and reserved them for casualties from this operation. And thankfully, they weren't used because, yes, we had some army injuries, but I don't think they were hospital cases. That was the, the end of that helicopter side of it. Earlier, I said that was our largest operation. And with 52 aircraft of our aircraft. But later on, there was even a larger operation. 
I just want to mention quickly about this. I was not involved with that because later on, as I said in my previous talk, I was now uh, on the, the hangar floor as a, a technical administration role. But anyway, this was a bigger operation than the one we had done, but it heavily involved South African forces, heavily. And it happened at the latter part of 1979, in other words, not long before Zimbabwe became independent in 1980. But it was at a time where we were getting full on cooperation from our South African friends. Um, this was aimed at a town which was a huge military garrison involving. Uh, the Mozambique troops who helped our terrorists. And as I say, it was a huge military camp at Mapai. <clears throat> our name for this operation is Op Uric, and I think you blokes, you South African blokes, referred to that operation as the bootlace. But anyway, it was in an area that we referred to as our Russian front. I just want to tell you that with the Canberras, there were three plus three. When I say that, three of our Canberras and three of SAF's Canberras were involved with that. There were eight of our Dakotas and four of your Dakotas involved, where there were 12 tumors. And um, I'm not sure how many freelons. I think it was two freelons involved. There were six of our Bell helicopters, which we referred to as cheaters. There were eight Alouettes. I think the Alouettes were all in the KCAR configuration. I'm not sure. And six hunters. Over and above the six hunters, we were told, they weren't required, but we were told that there were Mirage 3s on standby for this operation as well. So you blokes were heavily involved with this. It was an unfortunate operation because that's when a Puma was shot down. I think everyone remembers Puma number 164. There were three of the South African crew in that Puma and our troops, the RLI troops, and they all lost their lives. We also lost a Bell helicopter. <clears throat> the tech was killed, but the pilot survived. And if anyone has further information about that operation, I think you people would be welcome to hear of anything towards that. Is this something I wanted to talk about? Uh, it's not about choppers, but just about South African help. Um, on Hawker Hunter pilots, I think one of those episodes, there was a British pilot who was talking about his experiences with the Hawker Hunters. And a question was put to him, did your hunters ever use external missiles for combat? And his answer was, says, no. There was no way a hunter could facilitate that. Uh, those days when the hunters were first introduced, they had the four cannons and their role was for air-to-air -air combat, for using their cannons to shoot down those Russian bears, what, et cetera. I just want to tell you of how wrong he was, because obviously he wasn't aware of what the Rhodesian Air Force had done. But in combination with the very, very great help of South African the SAF, the later part of our war, the Zambians received MiG-21s. And now with the MiG-21s, our hunters with only front guns were no match for them 
If we were doing raids in Zambia and those mix came to intercept, our hunters wouldn't stand a chance. So what the South Africans did is they came and fitted uh, sidewinders to our hunters. I've no idea what the involvement was, but our hunters now had sidewinders, and I spoke about this in, I was, in the days when I was in the Mirages. They were heat-seeking missiles that also communicated with the pilot who had a special helmet, and where the pilot looked, the heat-seeking head would also look. And when independence came up and Robert Mugabe has announced that he will be our new prime minister, the South Africans were very, very quick to come up and remove this equipment. And they took these heat-seeking missiles, these uh, sidewinders and their helmets away pronto. So at one stage, our hunters were capable of air-to-air -air combat with missiles. Fortunately, they were not used. Still talking about the hunters, Steve Murray, who you'd uh, interviewed before, on his talk on those fighter hunter pilot fighters, he mentioned that with the hunter and its four uh, 30 millimeter cannons, the Aiden guns, it was only to this day second to the, the A-10, the uh, Warthog, with its um, revolving cannon. So it just shows you the cannon firepower that those hunters had when they fired all four 30 mil guns at the same time. The Mirages only had two of those. So I just thought I'd bring it up as a matter of interest. Thank you. Oh, see, I think that's it. I'm done. Okay, Doug, I say thank you so much um, for your participation, for sharing all of your thoughts with us. Um, I do see that once these of all three programs have aired, that there could be questions that I'll then compile and put on uh, uh, the email and send them off to you, and then maybe we can address <laughs> those questions, uh, if that's okay with you. We do a number four in a few months' time. Uh, that would be great to uh, to consider doing that. But for now, um, as I've always said, yeah, uh, it is it is so 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 uh, rewarding to be sitting here and listening to you share your stories and your tales. And uh, I just shake my head because yes, I was also a flight engineer in the South African Air Force, as many of you may know. Allos, uh, many hours on allos, uh, but you guys took a hammering and you just went back and you took more of a hammering. Uh, I was permanent force, so I had no choice. It was my job. I chose to do the job and then I chose to become a flight engineer. Uh, but you, you know, um, did much the same. But here, yeah, the uh, attrition rate on the aircraft seemed very, very high. Um, and yet you guys basically all came home every time, wounds or not wounds, but you came home with, with uh, arrows to patch up. And uh, so you were blessed. Um, and for that, that's why we have the opportunity and the privilege to be sitting here listening to Doug Sherry's stories. And I'm going to say thank you very much. I'm going to reiterate. Uh, I think it was in episode one where I said, folks, if you recognize your name, um, please come and share your stories with us. The email address will scroll down the bottom here again now, about now, right here. Um, also, uh, Doug has made uh, placed an open invitation there about that Opsuric. If you have any more details, if you want to come and tell us about your experiences do that during that operation, SAF and Rhodesian, that will be interesting to, to get. Uh, one or two of each uh, of the folk that partook in that uh, to join up and come and talk about it. I'll facilitate it 
and uh, we can even get Doug to sit in then on that one if he so so wants to. Thank you very, very, very much, Doug. And I also yeah. have to say thank you to Jackie for helping Doug. Uh, Jackie is Doug's spouse, um, and she's been most kind in doing most of the communication and helping Doug. And I, I, I before I go and uh, as a, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you, the both of you uh, there in your warm tropical paradise. Have fun and enjoy. Thank you so, so much. Ek gaan nou sê, so hard is wat ek kan Afrikaans praat, mooi bly en soet wees, ok? Dank u meneer. Dank u meneer. <laughs> <laughs> ok, bye! bye. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe and ring the bell to receive notifications.